cloud. Okay, so I'll have to splice this in now. Um, we'll follow that onto the next slide. Right, so strain with no recording, but we will add one in later. Okay, let's now move on to tensile testing of materials because we want to use our definitions of stress and strain and understand how a material behaves when you load it. So what we're going to do is we're going to do something called a tensile test. So the basic mechanical properties of engineering materials are usually determined through a tensile test. And again, you probably would have seen this before. Um, there's an image of a tensile testing machine, which has basically got two grips that you can use to grip a specimen. Uh, there's a load cell, which measures the load in the load line. And then this particular one applies the load by uh, its screw driven uh, displacement control. So you drive the cross head up and down under displacement control, which applies a load to the specimen. And in the tensile test, you increase the load at a steady rate while the deformation is measured until the test coupon fractures. Um, and what you normally do is you control the strain rate. The testing standard will tell you what sort of strain rates you're using because the mechanical properties of materials do tend to vary with the strain rate. So at room temperature um, in a steel, you're actually quite tolerant uh, to strain rate in terms of what tensile test response you will get unless you go up to very fast impact type strain rates in which case you will see a different response. At higher temperatures, like the temperatures you use for hot forming, uh, the response gets very strain rate sensitive because you get processes like creep going on at the same time. So your testing standard will tell you what strain rate you should be using. And the coupons you test are usually little cylinders, uh, which you can see on the left, or what we call flat dog bone specimens, where you've in, they've all got a common feature that you have a gauge section which is somewhat thinner which is where you want to measure the strain and where you want the failure to occur and then you have a section where you are applying the load either through a screw thread or through uh, a, a flat which you want to be bigger because you don't want failure to occur there because you won't be able to measure what's going on. And I've got a little video to show you um, with no sound, but it just shows a tensile test taking place. So let's now share the tensile test. Right, so this is, as you can see, a cylindrical specimen. Um, it hasn't got an extensometer on to actually measure the strain. So whoever's doing this test is just using the crosshead displacement. Uh, to measure strain. If you start it, although it's difficult to see, it is gradually extending uh, as the load goes up. What you will see is now is it's starting to form a neck. Can you see it's contracting faster in the middle? And eventually all the deformation localizes at that neck and it goes bang and fails. So you can watch that as many times as you like. It's not very exciting. But basically what you see is initially all the deformation is relatively uniform along the specimen until you reach a high enough stress and a high enough strain when the deformation localizes and it forms a neck and fails. So that's generally what happens in a tensile test. So let's now change the share back to the one we want. Okay, so I'm hoping that you can see the screen again. So what we're going to do here is now look at what the characteristics of a tensile test are. We're going to plot the engineering stress against the engineering strain. So the independent variable is the strain. We're putting that in at a constant rate and we're watching how the load behaves and we're converting that back to stress using the initial area, cross-sectional area of the specimen. And of course you initially get a reversible region where the stress rises in proportion to the strain. And if you just went up and down that loading line, 
you would find that it was all reversible because that's elastic deformation. You then, of course, get a point where the slope decreases and the strain you get for a given increment of stress goes up dramatically. And that carries on until the stress starts to fall and then you'll get a final failure. And of course, we know that the elastic region is where what you're doing is you're pulling the atoms very slightly further apart, which is a reversible process because the strain energy you put into that can be got out again by just releasing the load. And in that elastic region, the stress is directly proportional to the strain and it's controlled by Young's modulus. Then you get plastic deformation and plastic deformation is driven by dislocation motion. So you're pushing dislocations through the structure. You're permanently changing its shape because on average, the atomic bonds are no longer being stretched further. You're accommodating all your deformation by moving dislocations around and that's an irreversible process. So you get permanent deformation now. Uh, and the yield stress is the point at which the dislocations start to move, at which the metal or the alloy begins to deform plastically. Up until that stress, if you unload it, you'll recover all the strain and the strain will go back to zero. If you unload it at a higher strain and a higher stress, what you'll find is you don't recover all the deformation. As you unload, you go down a line of slope E until you reach zero stress. So what you've done there is you've relaxed the elastic stress, the elastic strain, sorry. You've relaxed the elastic strain, which was the bit of the deformation which was still pulling the atoms apart. But you can't reverse the dislocation motion just by taking the load off. Um, so you end up with a permanent displacement when you unload. And that is irreversible plastic deformation. And of course, in forming, that's what you're actually trying to put in. You're not interested in elastic deformation because it will spring back afterwards. Uh, what you want is a permanent change in shape. So you're working in this region of plastic deformation. And finally, of course, you get failure. And what happens in failure is when the neck forms. Um, and we'll come back to that on the next slide. Two things to remember are that elastic deformation is not a constant volume process because on average the atoms are moving slightly further apart. So uh, if you remember that very first picture I showed you, when you extend that little cuboid by pulling on the ends, it contracts laterally, but actually it doesn't contract enough for the volume to be constant, which is why Poisson's ratio is 0.3 for a steel and not 0.5. So you're actually moving the atoms further apart and it's that further apart movement which is reversible and recoverable. Plastic deformation is a constant volume process. Poisson's ratio is 0.5. Uh, so the volume is changing, is not changing, sorry, because on average dislocation motion is not moving the atoms further apart. It's just allowing the whole shape of the component to change. So that's an engineering stress strain curve. If we then say, well, what happens if we move to true stress and true strain, then you find you get a slightly different response after yield. And I'll put it on there. So, um, the elastic response you, looks pretty well identical because the strains are so low that the differences between engineering and true components of stress and strain are not large. Once you yield, then you start finding that the instantaneous A is getting smaller compared with the initial A. And the differences between the log L over L naught and the conventional definition start to rise. So the true stress, true strain curve is always above the nominal, the engineering stress, engineering strain curve. And that's that red line. And then they diverge quite significantly once it starts to neck. Because once it starts to neck, the cross-sectional area where the stress is applied and the deformation is concentrated is getting smaller rapidly, which means the true stress is getting higher rapidly. So you can see near failure, the true stress and 
engineering stress curves diverge. So that's what you see as the differences between the two. So why do we bother? Well, which the first question I suppose is which strain measure is sensible for a metal forming operation? And so let's do a little thought experiment. We'll take a bar that's 10 millimetres long and we'll stretch it to 20 millimetres. So, and we can calculate the increment of engineering strain, which is L2 minus L1 over L1, 20 minus 10 over 10. And that's one, and that's a very large engineering strain, by the way. Um, so the engineering strain for extending it from 10 to 20 is one. Then let's stretch it by a further 10 millimetres. Well, now the engineering strain is 30 minus 20 over 20 because the initial length is larger. So the strain increment, the engineering strain increment for your second operation is 0.5, which is all well and good. Unfortunately, if you say, what's the total engineering strain for this operation, where you're going from 10 to 30, it's not 1.5. You can't add them together because it's actually 30 minus 10 over 20, which is two. So engineering strains are not additive. And they're also only approximately correct. So actually, given you're putting very large deformations in during metal forming, it's probably not a good idea to use this. True strains are different. So if you do the same calculation, epsilon or E1, the true strain increment, is 0.693 for the first stretch. The increment for the second stretch is 0.405. And the increment for the whole thing, where you go all the way from 10 to 30, is 1.099. And if you do that sum in your head, you will find that the logarithmic strains, the true strains, add up. And that's why we use true strain in metal forming, because actually it makes sense. True strains are useful for working with the large deformations associated with metal forming. OK. So when we move to a forming operation, um, we've always got large strains because we're deforming it plastically. So we usually ignore the elastic part of deformation. Um, the elastic deformation will be a, pro a, a combination of the fact that your billet or whatever you're deforming deforms a bit elastically before you start. And also, of course, the fact that the structure you're using to deform it has an elastic stiffness too. What we're actually interested in for simple calculations is just the plastic deformation. Because plastic deformation takes place at constant volume, then we often make a constant volume assumption for doing calculations on simple forming operations, because it's actually pretty good. Um, if the temperature changes are relatively small, it's a good assumption. So if in your hot forging, it's not cooling down very much, then you can assume it's a constant volume process. If you allow it to cool a lot, a lot during the process or heat it up a lot during the process, you might start worrying about thermal expansion or contraction. But for the sort of calculations we're going to do, we're going to assume this is an isothermal process. We're not going to let it heat up or cool down too much. Now, sadly, that simple tensile test that we did is actually not very useful for doing forming calculations because of this problem of tensile instability. The fact that you can't actually get more strain into a tensile specimen uh, beyond the necking point. So actually, we tend to use tests that are better representative of forming. Uh, one of them is called the bulge test, and the other is a compression test. And let's check the timings. So what we'll do is we'll have a quick look at these two. Um, we'll start out with the bulge test. Um, now this does exactly what it says on the tin. Uh, what you do is you start out with a sheet of material, of metal, and you can see 
some sheets of metal that have been bulge tested on the left hand side. It starts out as a nice flat disc, probably, and you clamp it into a stage that allows you to pressurize it. So that diagram on the right, the left hand side of the diagram on the right, you've got a stage that you clamp it down onto and it's flat. Uh, you have a lock, basically an upper die and a lower die. The upper die is a ring. The lower die is a plate with a gap in it, which allows you to pump something in there. And you clamp it good and hard, which means that you can then pressurize the gap between the sheet and the lower die. So what you do is what you can see on the right. You pump it up, you pressurize it, um, probably with water, which is incompressible, because pressurizing with gas, which is compressible, makes for very exciting explosions when things fail. Um, so what you're doing is you're blowing it up like a balloon. Um, you're bulging that sheet. So it applies hydraulic pressure, i.e. pumping fluid in, to one side of a clamped circular sheet specimen. And it deforms into a dome. And what it's actually doing is generating a biaxial stress state. Uh, if you pump a balloon up, or if you pressurize a sphere, you'll generate a two-dimensional stress state in the, surf in the material that forms the balloon or forms the pressure boundary of the spherical pressure vessel, where the stresses in the two directions are equal, an equibiaxial stress state. Um, and that's actually quite a useful thing if you're worrying about deep drawing, which we'll come to in, le in lectures next week, or stamping, because deep drawing is basically putting a biaxial stress state in, a biaxial tensile stress state, to stretch your initially flat disc into your beer can, your kitchen sink, or whatever else you're trying to make out of it. Um, and because it's a two dimensional stress state, you actually can generate much higher strains before necking occurs, um, uh, which is useful. And the other thing is because it's quite representative of a deep drawing operation, you can actually use it as a qualitative measure of how good your sheet material is for the operation you want to do. How formable is it? And you use the bulge height, the dome height of failure, as a crude measure of how formable your material is. How much deformation can I put in? And um, that allows you to rank alloys and processing routes for the deep drawing operation that you wish to perform. You know, how much strain do I need to be able to take? Um, and you can also use it for quality control. So if you were, uh, want to make a million beer cans and you bought in a batch of sheet, it will be sensible to test that sheet to make sure it meets your formability requirements before you start feeding it into the beer can making machine. Because what you don't want is to have a whole load of leaky beer cans at the end of it because you bought in material that doesn't meet your specification. So. It's a good qualitative measure of how formable things are. And it's also quite good for quality control to check that the material you're buying in is going to be able to take the forming the deep drawing or the stamping operation that you wish to perform. So that's the bulge test. Uh, and I think there it says batch to batch variability. The compression test, again, is a relatively simple thing. What you do is you take a short cylinder of the material of height H and you squash it between two large platens and you measure the load and you measure H and you can use that to work out the stress and the strain. So there you are, you're squashing it down. And of course, because you're squashing it, it's expanding. Um, it's the opposite of a tensile test. And the nice thing about this, there is no possibility of forming a neck in this. So you can go to very, very high strains. Um, so this says what I've just said, the cylindrical specimen compressed between flat patterns and you watch the load displacement response. And that provides data that's actually relevant to 
processes like forging, rolling and extrusion, where you're basically putting compressive stresses into bulk material, which is what you're doing here. Um, now, it isn't quite as simple as it first looks because of friction. If you squash it without any attempt to ameliorate friction, it bulges because the frictional forces act to restrain the radial expansion that it wants. So they act to pull the top and the bottom of this initially uh, cylindrical thing that's turning into a donut. They act to restrain its radial movement. There's another force acting on that. So it doesn't move as far out of the top as it does in the middle. And this is undesirable if you want to do calculations because you actually don't want friction forces because you're going to have to take them into account in your calculations and they're difficult to measure. So what you do is you actually machine a whole series of annular rings in the top and bottom of your cylindrical specimen and you fill them with lubricant. Uh, because if you can lubricate that surface and minimize friction, you will minimize bulging and the load displacement response will be less compromised by the frictional forces that you generate if you're not careful. So that's a compression test. If you can minimize friction and bulging, it recovers a similar true stress versus true strain response to a tensile test. Another reason for using true stress, true strain, that the tensile test prior to necking is going to, well, in fact, even into necking, is going to re uh, recover the same true stress versus true strain response as this compression test, but the compression test will go to much higher strains. And if you then think about what happens if you work out engineering stresses and strains for something like that, you can see that no, it's not going to show the same engineering stress and strain profile as a tensile test. Okay. Right, we're still on material properties. Let's define the flow stress. Now, when you uh, cross a bridge or get in a car, you're rather hoping that that structure is going to operate in the elastic region of the stress strain curve. You don't want the bridge to permanently deform while you're driving a car across it. And of course, if your car permanently deforms, it's probably because you've driven it into something and then you have to take it away and scrap it. So most engineering structures operate in the elastic region, well below the yield strength. Um, metal forming takes place well beyond yield in the plastic region with large deformations. And we don't really want to know the initial yield strength. We want to know the stress at which further plastic def deformation occurs, the flow stress. And that will change continuously as the material work hardens during the um, forming process. So knowing what that is at any one time is useful and also knowing what its average value is through a forming operation is useful. And as I've said before, if the material work hardens, then the flow stress increases with increasing plastic deformation. In other words, as you ram that extrude through a dry, which we'll do later, um, if you're not careful, stress will go up. Um, friction is another thing you need to worry about. Uh, we've already seen that friction occurs during a compression test. Uh, anywhere you have an interface uh, where two things might want to slide across each other, you will generate friction. Um, and that friction will mean you have to put extra force in to perform your operation because it always acts to resist the deformation you're putting on. Now that means you very often need to have lubrication because most of the time you don't want friction. It increases the loads, it increases the cost. Um, now friction can be useful and two uh, areas we saw this last week were if you're doing a closed die forging, frictional forces at the die interface is where the flash form help in making sure that deformation acts to completely fill the die because it's more difficult to force material out through the gap against friction than it is to deform it into the remaining holes in the die. And rolling wouldn't work if there was no friction because you're relying on friction forces to pull the material through the rolls. 
So most of the time we don't want it, sometimes we have to have it. Something, the last thing we're going to say about material properties is the simple linear hardening model. Um, we won't use this in our calculations, but it's something to, to be aware of. What you can do is you can go from a, a complicated stress strain curve where you get a change in slope all the way through the plastic region to something we call linear hardening, where you represent the stress strain curve by two intersecting straight lines of slopes E and H. So E is Young's modulus, that's the elastic region, and that you can see is the steep dotted line here. Um, H is the strain hardening modulus, which is the one you can use to work out how the flow stress increases with strain. Um, and two simple versions of this, if you say E equals infinity, you're assuming there's no, plastic, no elastic deformation. Uh, so you'll basically go straight up the y-axis until it yields. If you assume H equals zero, you're saying you don't have a work hardening material. Plastic deformation takes place at constant stress, which is sometimes a reasonable working assumption. The yield strength, of course, is at the intersection of those two straight lines. Um, Right, that's the simple linear hardening model. Now we're going to start talking a little bit about extrusion. Um, we'll introduce it in the rest of this lecture, um, and then we will do some calculations on it in the following lecture tomorrow. So, if you've ever played with Play-Doh, you actually have performed extrusion operations. Um, all toddler group groups do extrusion. So that's a Play-Doh uh, kit. It's got a dies, which you use to form the shape of your extrude. It's got a chamber. It's got a ram to push your billet, which is your Play-Doh, out through the die. And so there's another picture of the same thing. And there's a picture of Play-Doh extruding a hollow component. So extrusion is just Play-Doh for engineers. You're doing the same thing. You're plastically deforming material out through a die to change its shape. OK, now it's a little bit more complicated than that. We mentioned yesterday that there's two forms of extrusion, direct or forward extrusion, where the ram and the extrude move in the same direction, and then indirect or reversed extrusion, where the ram and the extrude move in opposite directions. We'll show those in another slide in a moment. Um, and we showed you this picture of the large equipment we can use last time, and those are typical extruded forms in aluminium. So you can make very complicated things with extrusion, as long as they are long and thin. So direct or forward extrusion, that's the same picture blown up. You can see you've got a chamber, You've got a die, you've got a billet, and you've got an extrude, and you've got a ram. And the ram moves in the same direction as the extrude. So the ram pushes the billet material through the die to obtain the final section of the extruded part. Now, in this configuration, the extrude moves in the same direction as the punch. That's forward extrusion. And those are typical extrusion dies. Um, and those are dies for aluminium extrusion. And there's some dies for food extrusion on the left. Those are for making either exciting pasta shapes or Haribo or something like that. Now, if you're um, trying to extrude aluminium or steel, then you'll be using specialized high strength steel for your dies and they'll be expensive. If you're extruding um, pasta, you can probably go with stainless steel. Um, so there's some examples of extrusion dies, and there's a Play-Doh extrusion die. So they're not always flat. Uh, this is a picture showing a die, um, and there are often two angles associated with a the die. There's the die angle, which you can see at the back, and the clearance angle, which you can see on the right. Um, now, very often, uh, if you're doing a simple extrusion, you assume the die angle is 180 degrees, a square die. Um, now, in practice, you don't do that because you actually end up with 
extrude material in a stagnant region there, uh, a dead zone, because the flow of the material means that you end up with stuff trapped there that will never get out through the die. So very often you have a die angle that's less than 180 to aid the flow of the material into the die. The clearance angle uh, is there to make sure you don't rub against the extrude. Uh, a non-zero clearance angle is used to reduce friction and to reduce the possibility of damaging the extrude by the friction uh, deforming the surface and ruining your surface finish. So those are die and clearance angles. Um, let's now have another look at indirect or reversed extrusion. Um, so here we have indirect or reversed extrusion where you can see this is a ram that's pushing a die uh, into the chamber and the extrude is coming out in the opposite direction to the ram and the billet is not moving on average while you're doing it. The billet is just sitting there in the die until it starts to deform, sorry, in the chamber, until it starts to deform to go out through the die. So in indirect or reversed, the extrude moves in the opposite direction to the punch. The punch is actually now defining the extrude profile, so it's also acting as a die. So it's a little bit more complicated than forward extrusion. The billet doesn't move and that has an advantage because you get less friction because you're not scraping the billet along the side of the chamber while you're pushing it out. But the maximum length of the extrude is now limited by the ram length because if you make your ram too long, it buckles and you don't want that. So this is better suited to relatively short extrudes, whereas the forward extrusion, you can make them very long. Um, and here's a picture showing a hollow part being extruded. So on there, you can see that you're actually got a ram um, where you're defining the, uh, the shape of your extrude between the chamber and the die now, not just by the die. And here's an example of direct extrusion of a hollow component, which is where you're extruding tube. Um, and what you're doing here is you have a thing called a mandrel, which you attach to something called a dummy block. You then drill a hole through the billet uh, and you put the mandrel through um, and then you push against the dummy block. And you can see that what happens then as the ram moves forward, you're, you're forcing the extruded material to flow between the mandrel and the die surfaces, uh, and that then forms the part. So the interior profile is formed by the mandrel, and the exterior profile is formed by the extruding die. So that gives you another thing you can do. This is the extrusion video that we saw last week. So if you want to watch this after the lecture, then it will actually show you some of this in action again. Uh, but there's nothing new that you haven't seen already here. So how does metal flow? Well, let's do a direct extrusion with a simple 180 degree diagonal. Uh, the first thing you see is that you've got a dead metal zone in the corner, which I mentioned earlier. That's where stuff gets trapped because metal prefers to flow smoothly out through the die. The ram is moving from left to right. So what you find is that most of the deformation, most of the plastic deformation occurs near the die because close to the punch, basically what you're doing is pushing the billet material steadily towards the die. It's only when you start to want to reduce its diameter that you start getting significant shape change and plastic flow. So all the plastic flow is taking place near to the die and it's just behind it actually. Um, now what you also find is that billet material close to the die moves faster near the centre than it does near the container walls. Uh, in other words, the stuff that's coming down and out through the middle ends up moving faster than the stuff that's coming down along the edge and out. And that's because of friction, again, because you've got frictional forces acting to decelerate, to restrain the material that's running along the edges. So the only way you can overcome those shear forces 
is by putting more shear forces into the material, which means you end up with a velocity profile there. Um, you get more deformation in the middle than you do on the edges. And that has consequences when you worry about defects later on. Here are some typical extruded forms. You can produce very complex uniform sections in long lengths. Um, very common for aluminium and brass, um, but you can do steels as well. Um, and here's some examples of extruded aluminium window frames where you're building your window up from a whole series of extrusions that you're then connecting together in various ways. And you can make very large components. These are basically railway carriage components. Uh, you've got the roof on the left and you've got a whole series of beams that form part of the sides or the underframes of the carriage there. And what you do there is you're using fabrication to produce individual long So another example of multi-stage manufacturing processes. Right, the final thing we're gonna start looking at today is the load displacement history we'd expect for extrusion. And I'm using an example of cold extrusion here. Um, we'll introduce this today and then we'll come back to it tomorrow. So as you might expect, it's quite complicated. This graph is showing punch load on the y-axis versus punch travel on the x-axis. So the punch is moving from left to right. And right on the right-hand side, if it keeps on going at the end of what we call zone C, it will hit the die. So you can see there are three zones there. We call them A, B and C, or phases. A, we call the coining phase, where you're setting it up to get it going. And that includes any elastic deformation of both the billet and the forming machinery that you get. B is the steady state phase, where most of the action is taking place. You're creating your extrude. And C is the final non-steady state phase, where things start to happen close to the die and where eventually you'll have to stop. So we've got coining, steady state, and non-steady state. Uh, now, forward and reversed extrusion are slightly different. Uh, you can see that the forward extrusion one is slightly higher than the reversed extrusion one in zone B, the steady state phase. That's because there's more friction in forward extrusion, so you need higher loads, and that's because the billet's moving. And also, the deformation you need to do to get things going is different in forward extrusion, which is why the coining phase is different. OK, we can now look at this in a little bit more detail. So the first thing we get is elastic deformation and load is proportional to displacement. Then we get coining. Basically, the billet is changing shape to fill the container because it won't be quite the right shape. Um, and the load's rising as it starts hitting the edges. And it's also starting to bulge through the die, but it actually hasn't started to flow significantly yet. As the billet starts to move relative to the container walls, in other words, you're going from static to sliding friction, then there's a slight fall in the load because sliding friction is lower than static friction. And then you get a progressive fall in friction force during the steady state phase because the length of the billet, which is in con contact with the container wall, reduces. So there's less friction. So here we've established our steady state deformation to form the extrude and we're just pushing the billet steadily through. OK, the end of the steady state phase is when the punch is beginning to get quite close to the end. And what's happening here is the first thing is we've set up a plastic flow regime that's getting stuff to come along uh, inwards and out through the billet. And suddenly the punch starts moving into this regime. So you've got this rigid punch moving in and that's going to change the plastic flow field. And, and just take it from me that that initially reduces the load a bit, but that doesn't last 
because eventually the residual billet becomes very small. And what you're actually trying to do is push hard on it in one direction and make it squeeze radially out through the extrude. And of course, that's going to produce massive friction forces and compression over the die. And the, so the load rises rapidly and you need to stop at this point because you end up damaging your tooling. You have to accept you're not going to get everything out. You have to stop the extrude before you ram the punch into the region where the load gets very, very high. So that's what happens during cold extrusion. And that's all I've got to talk about today. Um, so I'm sorry, this has taken actually quite a long time. Uh, I was expecting this to be much quicker than that. We've got a few moments to take some quick questions. Um, uh, if not, then we'll reconvene tomorrow or we can use the, um, the discussion board. Shalom, a question. Hi, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes. Um, so two things. On the slide where you had the, um, the two lines and we kind of found the intersection. This was the linear hardening line, was it? Uh, the, was it? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Do you want me um, to put that one up again? If possible, thank you. Yeah, let's see what we can do. Right, so the tangent modulus line. Uh, I just got to find it. There we are. Right, so let's just share this. Is that the one you meant? Yeah, thank you. Yes. Um, yeah, so can you just go through again how you found how you found the various different parts? I get the first. I'm assuming the first part of the shot with the high gradient is your, your general um, elastic region. That's right. Yes, yes. That's just Young's modulus. So it's it's exactly it's exactly the same as the elastic region in any tensile test, provided you've put instrumentation on that's sensitive enough to uh, detect elastic deformation accurately um then it's the same and the the um one the tan the the, the tan yeah. of the h well, how yeah. does that work so what you're saying there you've got a slope h um which h is indeed stress over strain just like young's modulus is stress over strain um but if you go back to a previous slide effectively what we're doing is we're saying we're going to take the initial portion of this plastic region and we're going to assume it's just constant slope and for true stress true strain it's probably not bad we're not going to worry about the fact that it might be non-linear we're just going to say let's assume it work hardens at a constant rate so in other words, that's a straight, that red thing, or indeed the black thing is a straight line. And we just want to know what gradient is. To take, to find that straight line, because it is, in fact, it is nonlinear. Um, would we take the average, or would we just take the initial tangent and go depends, like that? Depends on the material. Um, you would prob, and it depends on the strain range you want to work over. Um, so for a, a low carbon steel, you would probably take the initial slope um, for an aluminium out of different materials behave differently. Some have not quite curved work hardening. Some have relatively straight work hardening curves for quite large increments in strain. Then it's pretty obvious that linear hardening is a good model. Um, there are some materials for which linear hardening is not a good model um, because you know, you've only the H that you choose is only going to be valid over a small increment in strain. Right. But it's, it, it's a useful step between full stress strain curve and elastic perfectly plastic. Oh, so just on the, back on the um, slide 14, um, if the yes, yeah, so where, where do we that point where we this, where you've almost got the boundary lines and you and then you draw the curve in between them? Where at what point do you pull off the straight line and curve it? Well, that's uh, what that's showing is what really happens during a test. <laughs> So the, the model that you're using is the two orange dotted lines. Right. So elastically, it basically it follows the elastic curve all the way up until the yield strength. 
and then after that it follows the tangent modulus, the uh, the heart the strain hardening modulus. Um, is that is that saying that it doesn't go? It's not an immediate from one directly drastically yeah. to the other. It gra it moves yeah. gradually. In, in, in reality, it's not. In reality, a lot of metals have quite a smooth transition from elastic behaviour to plastic behaviour. But in, in a simple calculation, that might be too complicated for you. Um, so if you ever go to create a finite element model of, of a structure and look at all the plasticity rules they allow you to use, you'll find that one of them is simple linear hardening. And all you have to tell it is Young's modulus, yield strength and H, and it does everything for you. But if that's not good enough because your material doesn't fit that very well, then you have options to do more sophisticated shapes of your hardening curves. So could I ask just one more question, if that's OK? Yeah. Um, on slide 12, I think it is. Yep, that's the compression test. Yeah. Um, just what's going, how does these, I get that you've injected some kind of lubricant to stop the friction so it's not pulling on the edges so it can expand uniformly. Um, but have we cut out a chunk of the material to do that? And does that not compromise? Well, you would have to be careful. Other things? Yes, it could. Yeah, yeah. Because you, you've you put these annular rings in. And of course, what that means is that some of that uh, cylinder isn't as stiff as the rest of the cylinder. So you would have to make a correct, if you were measuring the crosshead displacement, you'd have to make a correction or alternatively, you put an extensometer on it. So you measured the uh, H just over what you might call the gauge length, which is the bit that doesn't have these annular rings in it. Um, why can't we just use something like almost like a, um, like a cream that just lubricates the surfaces without well, changing I'm, I'm the dimensions? Sure, I'm, I'm sure people have tried that and it doesn't work because yeah? you wouldn't do these additional. You've got to have somewhere to go for your lubricant to go. Um, oh, right. Yeah, and, and and no one wants to put additional machining operations onto a component if you don't have to. So I think making it nice and smooth and just glooping cream on the top has turned out not to work. OK, thank you. Right, Jinka. Excuse me, excuse me, sir, I have a question. Uh, that's, oh, hang on, that's Jinka, isn't it? Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, for the young modulus, the, the graph, and there is a pro problem for me that how to find the plastic deformation is mm, is going to down and uh, when it uh, began to get the failure. Which which slide is this? Yeah, the, the plastic deformation and um, when the uh, uh, from my viewpoint, I think that with the mm, with the force act on the load is no no, no. when the load is uh, increased the Mm, differentiate of this graph becomes a little bit more, right? So if, if we're talking about a simple tensile test, um, oh. it, it, was, it was, was it the tensile test you're talking about or the compression test? Oh, okay. So my, my problem is that mm, the plastic deformation that where the ability of this will decrease, right, during the load is, is increasing. The, well, the plastic deformation always increases as the load increases. Oh, OK, I got, I got always, it. Always, yes. But of course, it's, you know, in a tensile test, it's tensile plastic deformation with a tensile load. And with the compression test, it's compressive deformation with a, a compressive load. But the mechanism underneath is the same. You're moving dislocations. OK, thank you. I got it. Alex. Um... Yeah, hello, sir. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, what do you really mean by the biaxial stress state in the okay. Borch test? Right. So have you done Moore's circle of stress? I don't think so. OK, right. Um, so. If you did a, do a simple tensile test, then you're applying a load on only on one face and the stress is in only one direction. So if you took a little cube of material, um, let me just 
unshare that. If you took a little cube of material and you said, OK, where am I applying the loads? The answer is I'm applying the loads on only two opposite faces. So I've got stresses in only one direction. OK, but it's possible to apply a stress in another direction at the same time. And indeed, you can apply stresses in three orthogonal directions. Uh, so when you work into a full three dimensional stress state, you could end up with a direct stress and a shear stress on each of those faces. But for, for the case of the bulge test, what you find is because it's thin, you end up with if you look if you looked at a little cube that was in that that bulging sheet, you'd find that there was a stress on each of the two faces that were in plane in the sheet. Yeah. Uh, and there would be a very small stress on the other face equal to an opposite to the pressure. Right. So biaxial stress means you've got stresses in two directions simultaneously. OK. Um, does, okay. that, does that make sense to you? Yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Thank you. Right. Have we got any more questions? No. OK, well, apologies for running over. This, this lecture doesn't normally run over. Um, if you do come up with additional questions, post them in the discussion board. I know I've got one from last week uh, to answer. So I'll answer those before tomorrow's lecture. Uh, and then we'll reconvene tomorrow at 4 p.m. to carry on with extrusion. OK, thank you very much all.